it's hard. Um, and I do think it's very pervasive. And I think it's pervasive as much for men as it is for women. I think that it's more socially acceptable for women to talk about it because it's, it's something that's been acknowledged as like, okay, you know, yeah, we have all these magazines telling us that we should look a certain way. Um, but this, this goes equally for men too. And I mm. think that that's hard. And I think, again, it's less socially acceptable for men. And that makes it really, really difficult. Um, there's a big difference between disordered eating and eating disorders. So eating disorders are a psychiatric illness and they're very, very serious. This is not something to mess around with. If you think that you might be on the, on the verge of that or you might be there, get help. Um, and a really good resource is NEDA. It's the National Eating Disorder Association. And it's just NEDA.org. Um, really, really awesome resources there, either for you or for somebody that you might be worried about. Mm. Um, of psychiatric illnesses, I think uh, eating disorders have the highest mortality rate. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so it, it's really important and it's really serious. Um, it's not necessarily something. So what causes an eating disorder, there's environmental factors, but there are very real biological factors too. So this isn't just something that you choose to do. It's not a matter of how disciplined you are with your right. eating. This is like a real uh, a real illness. Um, disordered eating can lead to an eating disorder, obviously, um, but, but there's a lot of gray area there. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of gray area between discipline and disordered eating too, mm -hmm. which is why it can be really helpful to go check out a website like NEDA. Um, can I, not to derail you, mm -mm. NEDA? Yes. I'm getting national or a New England dressage oh. association. <laughs> dressage. Hang on a second. Um, Google me. As Amber looks, we'll have it in the form. We'll have it in the form. Yeah. 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 Com. We'll get back to that. It's very important. Um, but it, it's a really great resource to. Did you find it? National eating disorders org. Okay. Really national out. eating disorders org. Plural disorders. Um, yeah. It has really, really great information on what constitutes disordered eating and, and what to look out for and what the risk factors are. But body image, like we were talking about, it's a major risk factor. And body image is super important for men and women mm -hmm. in sport. And so I think it's not something, you know, if you're predisposed to it, you have a lot of risk factors, you're in this environment, um, it's going to be a tough battle. Yeah. But the thing about eating disorders is they're 100% treatable. 100%. Like, you might have a biological disposition for it, but that is not your fate. Like, mm. you you can definitely get help and, and, and work on this and heal from this. So um, it's it's not all doom and gloom, but there are, you know, so reading up on it, getting some resources like that. One of the things I think is really, really important is just to develop a good support network. And this mm. is something that I would say to anybody getting into the sport, and even if you've been in the sport for a really long time. Um, for us in the pro peloton, it was really hard because – You'd be on a team, you'd make great friends, you'd have this whole support network with your teammates and your staff, and then contract season rolls around, it's like <laughs> it's mu musical point. chairs, and mm. then the next thing you know, you have a different director, different staff, different teammates, and every year it's different and it's shifting. And so what I realized pretty early on, and thankfully I had some great mentors, was it's really important to have a support network <laughs> that's portable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so people who are going to be in your corner and, and really have your best interest at heart 100% of the time, no matter what team you're on, no matter who your director is, no matter who your sponsors are, um, and have those people who are kind of independent third parties who really have your back. And and I think a coach is a big part of that. Um, but friends, parents, family, even former teammates, even if you're not on the same team anymore, um, having people that you can open up to and talk about this stuff with and who you trust to give you honest feedback to is really important. Mm -hmm. For the eating disorder side, I've talked to a I don't want to mention him now, uh, his name, but a high, very high level pro, male pro, mm -hmm. talked about, yes, he had it. They're so prevalent in male cycling yes. and nobody talks about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I want to get him on. We, we have to do it so he can talk specifically about male eating disorders. But like uh, you might, as a guy, you might think that like, oh, this is, you know, nobody's like this and I'm like right. this and there's like shame involved and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. But it's not the case. No. It's very, very prevalent. Yeah. Um, how would you classify, I guess, then disordered eating uh, in comparison to something that's more of like a <clears throat> discipline? Uh, the, yeah, or or I should say, you know, when you have eating disorders and then somebody that has like disorder or that's experiencing disordered eating, like what would you classify as disordered eating? There is an actual <coughs> definition for this, so um, I don't want to attempt that because I'm not yeah, sure I'll get it quite yeah. right. In your own in your own realm of experience, or or from what you've seen from other people, in your own words, yeah. I I think <coughs> I think you start crossing over when your relationship with food shifts. And that sounds really cheesy, mm. but you know, when, when food stops becoming, you know, a source of enjoyment and fuel and maybe a social aspect, if it starts becoming a source of anxiety, 
and um, a guilt. mechanism for control mm. and guilt and shame. I mean, then mm. then you're starting to spiral towards disorder disordered eating. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that those are some some good early warning signs. And so, you know, coming up with a really I think working with a nutritionist could be really helpful because sometimes I know for me, that was part of the reason I reached out to a coach early on. I was fortunate enough that in collegiate cycling, I had some really great teammates who were kind of teaching me training principles and racing tactics. Um, but what the big difference for me with having a coach and I ended up reaching out to a nutritionist for the same reason was I overthink things all the time. So I'm constantly <laughs> second guessing myself and I'm, you know, so if you're constantly second guessing, like, am I eating right? Am I eating enough calories? Am I not eating enough calories? Like working with a nutritionist who can just take the guesswork out of it for you and say, this is what you need to do. That can help a lot with the second guessing. And then working with a nutritionist as well can help you recognize if there are any red flags. And how do you find a good nutritionist? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, it's um, a hard challenge. It is a hard it challenge. Um, the nutritionist that I worked with, Kyle Pfaffenbach, P-F-A-F-F, E N B A C H is oh. really really <laughs> good. <laughs> Didn't expect that one. <laughs> um, he's really great, and 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 I'll I'll just tell you the story of when we first started working together because I think this was a really good sign. Um, in our first conversation, we we're doing the consult, and he's like, "Okay, well, the way that I operate is everybody's different, and we have to accept from the get-go that metabolism is a black box, and nobody understands how it works, which is not necessarily what you would." want to hear from an expert <laughs> trust me i know nothing on the matter <laughs> but honestly i found that so refreshingly honest because it's true mm. no one knows how this stuff works yeah and we do have a lot of scientific literature and from that we can distill out some some things that are you know and this was what he said he said there are some basic scientific principles that are generally agreed upon agreed upon and that the, the evidence supports we'll start there and then we'll see how it affects you mm. Yeah. And then we'll go from there. So working with a nutritionist who's not going to tell you on day one, I have all the answers, but they're going to guide you through the trial and error process of figuring out what works for you. And I think that that's a pretty good litmus test. I found one. I was uh, I was working with a nutritionist for a bit this year. Basically, we just tried to get myself like sorted and kind of like, OK, this is like a proper pattern. This is how you respond to certain things. Mm -hmm. And then it was just a short term thing. And it was actually really effective for me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, having a person to check in on could be helpful. But one of the big things that I found in, in trying to find every nutritionist that I could in this region is if I found extreme, like polarized evidence of any sort of like, whoa, like this person's like very fatty, like going toward fads or they're very much, you know, polarizing toward a lot of carb and absolutely nothing else or no carb and all protein, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Those are probably good signs that that person may not be a good one to work with. You know, it's it's right. it's something that's balanced and, and using it otherwise. I think um, anybody who tells you that you need to avoid certain foods, unless it's for like an actual proven food allergy, mm. that's also probably. Like, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Popeyes. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep that going. Is that, it, yeah, yeah we we're, probably we're, avoid the, most of the time. Yeah, most yeah, of the time, but most if time, somebody yeah. tells you like you're never allowed to have Popeyes yeah. ever in your life, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's a bunch of yeah. baloney. Like, yeah, yeah. But, but I like to have those meals after you do really well in a race. Mm -hmm. Then you go out and get yeah. something like yeah. totally. crazy. Sure. It feels good. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a I have a specific soda that I get after a race if I win only. We went and got Five Guys and <laughs> got like four pounds of French fries and huge oh, yeah, hamburgers after Carson City. <laughs> yeah, and that was a long day. We it destroyed like five it. Five hours, probably <laughs> two hours for you. Yeah, uh, but, yeah. yeah we destroyed yeah. that. We did well. <laughs>